Okay, this video will uh, look at what corresponds to, I believe, sections 2.4 2. Um, 2. and maybe 2.5 uh, in the text. This will be the truth functions of disjunction and conditional, and then uh, some more evaluation of compound statements only involving um, all four of the operators that we're going to be looking at. So disjunction. Um, do the same thing that we did with conjunction and uh, negation. I'm going to walk through um, an example of a compound statement, in this case a disjunction, and then we'll see what happens when the um, components are true or false. So here's the example I want to use. Um, atomic statement. Uh, Shelley won lotto and Shelley got a big inheritance. Suppose you and I are walking around and we see our friend Shelly driving around in a new uh, Mercedes and we know that she doesn't have much money and so we're sort of guessing how, how is this the case. And suppose my guess is this. I say either Shelly won lotto or Shelly got a big inheritance. That's my guess to explain why she's driving around in this expensive car. I can say either or. I could just say or. doesn't matter. Um, Let's just say or. Shelley either won lotto or got a big inheritance. That's my guess. Now, we flag Shelley down. She pulls over. We talk with her and we say, hey, what, what happened? What's new? And suppose, she, suppose both of these disjuncts are true. She says, hey, boy, this is really my lucky week. Um, I won lotto and I got a really big inheritance. So let's say both of these are true. She did win lotto. She did win a big inheritance. Was my guess right when I, when I guessed that disjunction? Yeah, yeah, my guess was right. Um, in fact, it was kind of doubly right. But um, clearly, intuitively, you wouldn't, you wouldn't look at me and say, oh, you were wrong, right? I was right. Now, granted, some of you right now have an intuition about this case with or maybe this should be false here. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But for now, hopefully you agree intuitively that you wouldn't say my guess was wrong when both of these disjuncts were true. If the first disjunct was true and the second was false, then my guess was also right, because I said or. She said, hey, I won lotto. We said, well, did you get an inheritance? And she says, no. So only the first disjunct was true, you'd still say that my guess was good, right? So the disjunction is still true. Ditto if the first disjunct is false and the second is true. She didn't win lotto, but she got a big inheritance, right? She inherited a million dollars. But suppose they're, so that's true also. Suppose they're both false, right? Suppose she says, um, uh, I don't know, she, um, she's driving it around because uh, she's just test driving it at a lot or um, someone gave her the car. It wasn't an inheritance, but you know, someone she knows just got rid of the car and gave it to her. So neither of the things I guessed were right. Well, then you would say my guess was, wasn't correct because neither of those things is what explained her, explained the fact that she's driving a Mercedes. So this is the truth function of disjunction, at least as revealed by our intuitions on this. Now here's one of the reasons that disjunction is a little bit tricky. It's because in English the word or and either or is actually ambiguous. It's one word, it's one statement operator, but it can symbolize two different truth functions. And that usually doesn't cause a problem for people who are communicating using natural language because Usually from context, it's obvious which one people mean. And so people just automatically, subconsciously use the right one. Okay, They don't realize that there's two different truth functions they're using. But everyone almost always selects the correct one, so people don't even notice that there's two different ones involved. Okay. Sometimes it's this function. Okay, And we're going to call this inclusive or because it includes the possibility that both disjuncts are true as making the disjunction true. Sometimes though when people say or they mean to exclude this possibility here. 
So if someone says you can have soup or salad, they don't mean that you can have both, right? They're trying, this is excluded. Now this isn't one of the functions we're gonna be talking about in this class. We're not gonna introduce an operator for it or anything. If we did, we might use this symbol, potentially a sort of um, the wedge with a little line under it um, might be one symbol you could use. We're not gonna use this, okay? I'm just introducing it now, we're talking about it to explain why it's the case that some people have this intuition that maybe this should be false here. That intuition is correct for this function. With exclusive or, if both disjuncts are true, the exclusive disjunction is false. But with an inclusive disjunction, it's true when both disjuncts are true. And you just kind of know, we know intuitively when um, when that's the case, okay? Um, if there's any resistance, if there are people who still think that this is, this is, well, you shouldn't think that. The, the uh, Shelley driving the car example. When you're making a guess like that, clearly people sort of are using this function. If you, if, if she uh, won lotto and got a big inheritance and you said, oh, your guess was wrong because you would be doing something kind of like cute and, and, and irritating, right? Because you would be insisting on using this function when clearly this is the one that's intended, right? You'd be like someone who said, like if I said, oh, I took my money to the bank and you pointed at the bank of a river and said, oh, you didn't take your money there, ha, 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 right? It's like, dude, obviously I meant the bank where you put money and not the bank of a river, right? So it's, it's ambiguous in that way and we almost always know which function is being used so we don't think about it. For purposes of this class, whenever we are talking about disjunction, it's always inclusive or. So we can forget this symbol now, forget this truth function. For us, this is disjunction, okay? And you might say, well, hey, what if, what if I want to talk about a case where we're excluding the possibility of both? Don't worry, we can still do that. I can express you can have soup or salad in this way, right? If P is soup and D is salad, I can say P or D and not P and D, so not both. So I can just explicitly rule out both, and that gives you exactly the same truth function here. Don't worry about that now, but my point is just that we're not losing any uh, expressive power by just only keeping the inclusive disjunction as one of our operators in this class. Okay, so that's disjunction. Next up is conditional, and conditional is also a little tricky, not too much, but just like it was tricky in, the, in chapter one when it came to translating, it's also gonna be a little bit tricky here. Um, here's, here's the example I wanna use, um, two atomic statements. You turn in all the homework. Now in our class, obviously there's no homework. Um, this is just a fictitious grading policy in a fictitious class. Um, but suppose in this class, suppose I'm teaching this fictitious class that has homework and you come up to me and say, hey, can you tell me something about um, the grading policy? And I give you this conditional. I say, if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A in the class. Suppose I tell you that conditional. And now we wanna see if I was lying or not. When, under what conditions was what I said true? Under what conditions was it false? Okay. Well, the class is over and let's suppose the antecedent is true. You turned in all the homework. And then let's suppose the consequent is true. I gave you an A in the class. So the antecedent and the consequent are true. Is the conditional that I said, is that true? Well, yeah, obviously. In these conditions, then you don't have any case to come back and say, oh, you lied when you said, if I turn in all the homework, you'll give me an A. Okay, so that's pretty intuitively obvious. What about when the antecedent is true, but the consequent is false? End of the quarter comes around, you turned in all the homework, so the antecedent's true, but I gave you a B or an F, right? So the consequent is false. So true antecedent, false consequent. 
well, then you got a pretty obvious case that I lied. Right? I said, if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A. You turned in all the homework, but I didn't give you an A. So I clearly lied. That was my, my um, the concept, the conditional is false. Now, row three is the slightly tricky one. Bear with me on this one. What if the antecedent is false, but the consequent is true? So the class is over. You didn't turn in all the homework. I suppose you only turned in half, but you didn't turn in all the homework. But I gave you an A. Question is, was the conditional false when I said, if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A in the class? Um, the answer is no. Now you might have an intuition that it is that I did lie to you, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, the reason, first off, I'm just going to put a true here because this isn't a lie in this case. Now here's why you might have the intuition that it's a lie. Suppose that I just give everyone an A, right? I'm just like the easiest grader ever. I give everyone an A. Someone comes up to me and says, tell me something about your grading policy. I say, well, if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A in the class. That's true. If I give everyone an A, then it's also true that if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A. It's also true if you don't turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A. Um, if you attend every class, I'll give you an A. If you miss every class, I'll give you an A. All of those conditionals are true, right, in this situation. The reason you don't like the fact that I put a T here isn't because this conditional isn't true, it is. If I give everyone an A, then clearly if you turn on all the homework, I'm going to give you an A. The reason you don't like it is because this conditional left out some important information, right? So you, you don't like this conditional because intuitively you can tell that if that's what I said and that's all I said and you walked away and I didn't follow up and say, oh, and that's because I give everyone an A. I didn't say that, I just told you that conditional you would be irritated with me for leaving out some important piece of information. Okay, so that's why you have this intuition or why this kind of, this T might rub you the wrong way a little bit. But hopefully, given my explanation, you can see that it's still true, right? If I give everyone an A, then it's still true that if you turn in all the homework, I'll give you an A, okay? It's misleading, maybe. It left out important information, but it wasn't a lie. Okay. And by the way, when I say lie, I just mean it's false in terms of like the logic of the situation here. It's still a bad thing to do, right? So you don't, I'm not in any way sort of suggesting that you can go around in real life, you know, squirming out of things by saying things that are technically true, but actually misleading. Being misleading is often just as bad as, as lying. It's a different thing though, that's my point, right? It's not the same thing as lying, even though it might be just as bad as lying. So I'm not saying that it's an okay thing to do, just because it's not a lie. Okay, now if they're both false, then clearly it's also not, the, the conditional isn't false. You didn't turn all the homework and I didn't give you an A. That's true. So the take home message here is that a conditional is always true, except with one particular pattern, true antecedent, false consequent. Okay, that's the only situation in which you'll get a false conditional, is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Okay, now what I'm going to do is we're going to walk through an example, like I did in the last video, uh, of evaluating a compound expression. I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to sort of walk through the construction of the truth table slowly, the difference is that now we're also we're going to have conjunction, disjunction, and conditional, all of those being used. There's no negation here, um, but negation's easy, as you can see. That's trivial. It's just the opposite. Okay, so I'm going to walk through this. We're going to construct a table. I'm going to go a little faster this time because you should have already seen the previous video. I'm still going to go step by step, but each step is going to be a little quicker. We're still going to construct a table. The number of rows is 2 to the n. Well, what's n here? 
it's two because we have P and Q. So we've got two atomic statements. So we need two squared rows is four. How many columns? Five. P, Q, P and Q. If Q, then P. And then the whole disjunction. So that's five. P, Q, P and Q. If Q, then P. And then the disjunction. P and Q or if Q, then P. So here's our table four rows, five columns. Step one, atomic statements up at the top in alphabetical order. Okay. Next, fill out the truth columns of the atomic statements so that you have all possible combinations of truth values. Um, and remember the way to do that, you go to the first top half T's, bottom half F's, move over by one row, alternate by groups of T's and F's half as big. By the way, if you do that procedure, the last atomic statement should always be alternating by one. True, false, true, false, true, false. If, that, if that's not the case, then something went wrong somewhere. Okay, next step. We're going to build up from, uh, we've already done the atomic statements, now the compound statements, whose components are only atomic statements, so the smallest compound statements, and then build up until we get to the biggest compound statement, the one we're doing the table for. So I put these up here in this order. And now we're just going to go through every cell in every truth column one by one. So first is here, P and Q. This is a conjunction. So I'm going to, here's the conjunction truth table. I'm going to just have this out here for this entire column. What are the two conjuncts, P and Q? So I'm making the first conjunct red, second conjunct blue. That's right here. Well, what is the conjunction? Conjunction is going to be true when the first and the second conjunct are true. So I'm putting a T there. Next. Row two, first conjunct true, second false. I'm going to find that combination here. And that combination turns out to be right here. First conjunct true, second false. It outputs false, so I'm going to write an F. Next up, false true, first conjunct true. P is, I'm sorry, false true, first is false. P is false, Q is true. That's right here, it outputs false. And finally, when both are false, both components, P and Q, are both false, that's there, it outputs false. So I write an F there. Okay. Next, I'm going to do the conditional, if Q, then P. So I'm going to do the top row first. Here's the truth table that we just did for a conditional. Antecedent is Q, consequent is P. So I'm going to make the antecedent red, consequent blue. Okay, so in row one, the antecedent is true, consequent is true. Antecedent true, consequent is true. It outputs true. So I'm going to put a T. Row two. Q is the antecedent in red. Antecedent is false, consequent is true. Where is that? Antecedent, false, consequent, true. It outputs true. Notice, up here this is row two and down here this is row three. That doesn't matter. You're not looking for the same numbered row. What I'm looking for is the row. Q is the antecedent, P is the consequent. I'm looking for the row where the antecedent is false and the consequent is true, because that's what's happening on this row. Antecedent is Q. Q is false. Consequent is P. P is true. So I'm looking for the row that has a false antecedent, true consequent. False antecedent, true consequent, outputs true. So I'm putting a T here. Now I'm going down to the next cell. Here, the antecedent Q is true, consequent is F. That's going to be here. Antecedent true, consequent F, 
outputs F. And then finally, the last row, both antecedent and consequent are false. That's going to be right here. And it outputs false. Okay, I'm done with that. Next up will be um, the disjunction. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to remind us of the disjunction truth function down here. First disjunct is this one, second disjunct is that one. So I'm going to make it red. First disjunct true, second disjunct is true. The output is true. Move down one. Here we have first disjunct false, second true. That's right here. First false, second true. It outputs true. Next one. First disjunct false, second disjunct false. That's going to be right here. First false, second false. It outputs false. Bam. Finally, we have first disjunct false, second true. That's going to be right here. First false, second true, it outputs true. Okay, and there's our truth table. Now, I think I'm going to end the video here because we've done um, a reasonable amount of stuff. I've introduced the uh, disjunction and conditional truth functions. And also we've done a, an example of a truth table that uses all of our two place operators, conjunction, disjunction, and conditional to make the compound statement. It didn't, there's no negation in there, but that's okay. We'll have examples um, coming up that use uh, negation. And that's it, study hard.